yeah, so do you want to just give some background into your current role and what you do? Um, yes, yeah, so I am a physiologist and I work for Swing Australia. Okay. And I'm based on the Gold Coast in Australia, which is on the East Coast. And in terms of my role, so um, I mainly am employed to support um, coaches and uh, their athletes to uh, make decisions on training and on planning and in terms of monitoring as well. So, yeah. Sounds good. It's like it's a very, very cool. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, very, Have you always cool. been in Australia or is that somewhere you've recently no. moved to? Yeah, okay. no, I'm actually <laughs> originally from Belgium. So the other okay. side of the world. And then I um, got an opportunity in New Zealand and I went to New Zealand in 2006. And now okay. yeah, since uh, six years almost, I'm, I'm in Australia. Yeah. Awesome. Nice, yeah, nice so and warm for you. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah, nice. And the, the weather is fantastic. So the Gold Coast, the beaches, they're fantastic. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. But yeah, yeah. so yeah. How have how things been? Like, because I know Australia is a bit further ahead than us yeah. in terms of their, yeah. the kind of lockdown situation. But how were things during that period? Because swimming pools were shut and um, obviously training would have been tricky. So how did you guys yeah, cope with have, that? Yeah, well, I think, yeah, we have been pretty lucky in Australia compared mm -hmm. to the rest of the world. So yeah. Yeah, it's difficult for everyone, I think, for our, our athletes as well. Like the Olympics are, are postponed, so it's difficult, but um, every, everything in perspective, we just hope that, you know, people keep uh, healthy and safe. That's the main thing. And um, so Australia is actually pretty lucky that we don't, haven't had that many cases and um, our weather as well. So uh, our swimmers here on the Gold Coast have actually been able to swim in the ocean and lakes and rivers, you know, so... Um, it's been good like it's been yeah. challenging um psychologically especially but um i think yeah we've been good so lucky yeah it's good. that's really good i mean it's it's yeah. good that you guys have been able, they've been able to swim in in, in some respect because here yeah. it's been like the, when the lockdown yeah, started it was still yeah. really cold so i mean yeah. now people yeah. are kind of getting out into the lakes and things but at the start yeah. it was like you couldn't you couldn't swim yeah. properly without you know a wetsuit and everything so yeah, yeah. yeah i know it's yeah. been tricky for a lot of people yeah but, um yeah. But yeah so i mean do you want to just give some insights into the like the key physiological targets for swimmers what when they aim, what do the coaches aim to hit to enable the athletes to perform well yeah okay um actually on this note i i'd like to share my screen because okay. i think it's there's an important um point to make um post disabled participant screen sharing okay i can't share it i think uh here we go, one second. Yeah. There you go, should be fine now. I'll try, here you go. Can you see this picture? Yes. Okay, there's just, um, before we start talking about physiology, I think there's a very important point to make um, uh, for any physiologist working with swimming. So here is um, an example of a question. So say you have a race, a swimming race. Yeah, and it could be a hundred meter freestyle, any stroke actually, freestyle, breaststroke, uh, backstroke, butterfly, to a fifteen hundred meter race, and say there's um, three people, so three people lining up, mm -hmm. and one of them is a Gael Gabrielassi, okay. so physiologically amazing, like huge VO two max, right? Okay. So he's in lane lane two, for example. Yeah, and then I don't know who this girl is, so I just took this picture from from. The okay, website, so she <laughs> might be a little bit older, but say. Say this, that it's someone that is around 11 years young, but is a yeah. swimmer and has really, really good swimming technique. Okay. Right. And then you have actually someone, so that's, that's in lane three and then lane okay. four next to it is someone that um, goes to the gym a lot and has very, okay. very big muscles, big <laughs> biceps, triceps, <laughs> abdominals, looks very good. Yeah. So say they had a swimming race, a hundred up to 1500, anything, okay. who, would you, who would you put your money on for you? I mean, I think it would probably be, the, mm, that's a tricky one. I'd probably say the VO2 max. Yeah, well, for, for me, it's definitely the okay. girl with very good swimming technique. Yeah. Okay. So swimming is very, very different. So sometimes you have people with huge physiology capacity, physiological capacity yeah. that they can't swim. They, can, they yeah. take a minute for 50 meters. Yeah. Right? This girl, like a girl with good swimming technique could actually swim 50 meters in 30 seconds, for example. Okay. And um, so these are generally, generally going to struggle if okay. they're not swimmers. Okay. So in terms of physiology, it's very important to note that um, whatever physiological ad adaptations we want to um, achieve, we do yeah. that on very good swimming technique. Okay. 
So swimming is very different. It's a different medium. And yeah. um, we don't use our swimming specific muscles that much, especially in that way. Okay. So when we talk about any physiological adaptations, we want to talk about um, making those, creating those adaptations onto a really good swimming technique. So my money would definitely be uh, on okay. this person in this race. That probably yeah, explains so I, why I'm not a very good swimmer then, because yeah. I've got a pretty good VO2 max, but I'm really bad at swimming. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's um that's just an important point. So I mean, we we'll, okay. we'll talk about physiology. So your question, what was your question again? On on it's, it's in terms of like what what training formats, what hit formats are typically used to? I guess in in this respect, how how is training um programmed to enable athletes to become good swimmers? So obviously, it's about the technique. Yeah, but they still need yeah. to have you know a good VO two max, definitely. I guess, to be to be the best. Yes, definitely, definitely, yeah. So um, with training, you actually want to change people, right? Okay. And in terms of physiology, you actually create lots of changes within. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes a challenge as a physiologist because you can't just open someone up and look inside how they've changed, you know, how many new capillaries or how many, you know, new, new mitochondria people have created. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, yeah, so training actually is purposeful towards uh, creating certain changes. And depending on what training you do, you're going to create certain changes okay um so yeah in terms of physiology if you purely look at physiology then the first one is neuromuscular changes so that's um, creating tech good technical patterns and then onto that um so if you do lots of aerobic work so this aerobic stimulus oxidative mm -hmm. stress and then higher intensities um so combination of oxidative and glycolytic stress okay and then at higher intensities again so uh, focusing on the glycolytic stress and then higher than that is a speed so if all those um, physiological zones, you're going to create changes. Yeah. Okay. So it's like yeah. for swimming, they you almost need every single hit format or hit type to enable the athlete to become to change in the way that will enable them to come the best. So, so yeah. yeah. Do you do you also include strength training in in that kind of mixture? Um, because yeah, I guess definitely. they they still need to be strong, even though yeah. they're good. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, so. Practically all the swimmers actually have a strength program as well okay. as part of their program. And generally, um, strength comes secondary uh, to, okay. to swimming. So swimming comes first mm -hmm. uh, because of what we talked about before. Sure. But sometimes there are periods uh, where uh, strength tra training becomes more important, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the beginning of the season, for example. So generally splits a season um, from September to December. Okay. which we call the, the preparation phase or the pre-season or the building phase. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, December to April generally, and that's what we call the mid-season. And then um, the final season, so the prep final preparation season and competition season uh, is, is generally from April all the way to the Olympic Games. Okay. Um, so when we want to create, uh, for example, strength changes um, where gym sometimes have, has more priority to swimming, mm -hmm. that would be in the beginning of the season. So okay. if you really want to, yeah, so the swim volume goes down, the gym uh, load goes up, and that's where there's more focus on strength. And also, like, for example, if you want to change uh, technical patterns, then that's the time to do it. Because okay. uh, close to the competition, that's too late. Then we really focus on um, a very specific work. Um, but in the beginning of the season, then, um, yeah, uh, there could be certain, um, um, yeah, certain type of work that are more important than later okay. on in the season. So yeah. is that like this period of time now where the competitions are quite, well, for most people, they're quite far away. Yeah. Is, there, is this the kind of period that the athletes will be working on their kind of technique and their strength so that they can, you know, become yeah. the so, better swimmer in the, in the yeah. long run? Yeah, so we have really good time now. So now we're generally in a building phase. Sure. But in the end, um, when you look at the Olympic Games, I think in 54 weeks, uh, the, the trials for our Olympic yeah. Games are about 54 weeks. So far away. Um, so it's a long time. So swimmers, any athletes, I think, sometimes it's difficult to, to look that far ahead. Mm -hmm. So what we do, we know what we want to achieve um, that many weeks, well, a year um, yeah. later. But we have to bring that down to a shorter term um, focus points. So it has okay. to be exciting some day and there have to be some goals shorter term that, that athletes are actually excited about. So that could be anything. It could be underwater kick. It could be kick sets. It could be uh, speed. And um, so it's uh, that's what we we work on by individual. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. So you were mentioning that technique is the kind of the key thing. 
So yeah. is that, does that explain why swimmers, I guess, in terms of, so if a swimmer's doing 100 metres and yet they spend hours and hours in the pool, is that, is that to enable that technique to develop or is that for something else? Yeah, so I think, yeah, so, so people aren't built to swim. We, mm -hmm. we don't, we walk and we, we run, but um, swimming, yeah, we don't generally use our swim propulsive muscles, except when we swim. Yeah. So to come better as a swimmer, you actually have to swim. And um, yeah, you have to create those adaptations onto good swimming techniques. So that's, that's done in the water. Yeah. So our swim is some, yeah, we also have cycling and running and, um, and gym. And that's okay. all to make people um, more athletic or to increase, um, to have some different cardiovascular stress. Mm -hmm. But in the end, uh, yeah, the, the swimmers have to swim to become better swimmers. Running is not necessarily going to make them uh, better swimmers. Yeah. Sure. Is, is the kind of, is the running and the cycling, I guess not so much cycling, but the running in the gym, is that also to help with bone density? Because I'm not sure yes. how, how swimming, because obviously it's lower impact. So is that also helping yeah. with that? Yeah. So from a health perspective, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But generally, yeah, swimmers, they spend a lot of time in the pool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So um, yeah. What was I going to say next? Let's see. So in terms of the high intensity work, how much of their yeah. um their training is spent at high intensity and then at low intensity yeah um well it depends what you mean with high intensity okay um so yeah so I've, i'm going to steal something on this question that i just heard from uh, i've been listening to so many pod podcasts okay yeah me too and and just uh, i've just been listening to one of uh, bob bauman who was a who was a coach of michael phelps for, yeah. yeah throughout his career and uh, he had a really good analogy and he um, he said something like um, imagine that you have a painter that only paints in black and white and you have sure. another painter that only paints in uh, red and blue right swim coaches actually across all the distances so you have sprint all the way to 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 distance they actually color with all the different colors right mm -hmm. so they're not just black and white not just um, blue and red but in the end, um, so endurance swimmers, so open water swimmers, 1500 meter swimmers, they will also have some element of speed, okay. right? But not as much um, as, uh, as sprint swimmers will have, because obviously yeah. for sprint swimmers, um, speed and anaerobic work is much more important. Um, but so your question as well, like the amount, the volume that they do also depends um, one on the individual and what they're training for, mm -hmm. also on their level of fitness so the okay. fitter you become the fitter you become the 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 faster you actually recover from high intensity work so okay. the, more, the more you can achieve and also the more you actually need to to keep improving right so it, it depends on the individual the event that they're training for the timing yeah. of the year yeah. and also um how fit and how um how to, how, how specifically fit uh, the athlete actually really is Okay, yeah. interesting. Is there any differences between, I guess, like development stage and in terms of the female, male and females, in terms of how much higher intensity work they do, or is that all dependent on the fitness level and the kind of needs of the athlete? Yeah, we can speak in, in very general terms, but, mm -hmm. you know, ev every individual is different though. So generally, um, um, female swimmers tend to recover faster okay. um, than male swimmers, but that's a general statement because yeah. Um, some, some, yeah, some females are very different. And also going through the junior development year as well, you know, then they haven't developed uh, strength just yet and, and the anaerobic capacity. So then uh, aerobic work, and when you talk about swimming, then definitely mm -hmm. the neuromuscular patterns, that's the most important thing to emphasize at, at younger, younger ages. Okay. But you can always have, a, always have that mix. So not everything like black and white, only black and white, always a mix of different strokes um, and different intensities. Yeah. So in terms of that, are there any other ways to manipulate the training session? So for example, I've seen um, people use those kind of the pull, the things on your hands. Um, I'm not paddles, sure what the name is, yeah. but yeah, you know, those things. And paddles. then, okay, yeah. paddles. And also um, in terms of nutrition, do you use that as well to manipulate the training kind of oh, yeah. training load? Yeah, yeah definitely. A variation of stimulus. Yeah. So mm -hmm. paddles. Um, so I like the term aquatic literacy. Okay. You know, so sometimes you play around with, with, with certain um, elements to actually increase your water feel, you know, so you have paddles, you have, you have all kind of different tools and big paddles, for example, they really work on strength, specific okay. strength, but um, it also it has something to um, having a really good feel 
for the water. You know, using different equipment. Also, for example, for us having some sessions in an ocean, it's very different. Um, having some sessions in in a in say a flume, and so it's all different. So when athletes um, understand that and actually can um, adapt to that, that's when you create a really good water feel. Um, we also have fins, and sometimes, for example, we use fins um, to um, have a little bit less load on the shoulders. For example, like if, if some swimmers have a have a bit of strain on the shoulders while swimming in fins and using the legs a little bit more uh, reduces that that uh, load on the shoulders. So you have mm -hmm. lots of equipment. Yeah, lots of equipment that we, we play around with. There was another element to your question, I forgot. Uh, I was just saying, is nutrition also used to manipulate the kind of the training session um, and the, the physiological yeah. targets you're hitting? Nutrition. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, nutrition obviously is very important. So one aspect that we have to say, if you, create, uh, if you want to create um, physiological changes, then you need building blocks, right? So nutrition is very important. And generally, we go from, um, we go from the, the strategy of, of energy availability. So when swimmers have to do like big blocks of work, mm -hmm. um, they have to have really good energy availability. And um, when, we when we target high intensity um, interval sessions, they need really good um, carbohydrate availability, glycogen availability. So um, yeah, there, there's a lot of education to be done. And um, that's where we are very grateful as well in Australia. We, uh, we have a nutritional team and that's our top um, swimmers actually work with mm -hmm. and they learn how to cook which is yeah uh, yeah i love those uh, cooking workshops and even yeah. like uh, yeah competitions against each other and i think it's not just um about eating for performance um it's also about having you know um having that that belief in what you do is right sure. and it's also about um healthy individuals so that goes beyond sport that we actually yeah. want to educate them uh, to become healthy individuals as well that's really good. That's, a, that's an approach that I think other sports need to, need to learn from. I know um, in athletics, we, well, I, I don't get much kind of nutrition support in terms of cooking. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really important thing, especially as you're saying, it's like building the healthy individual and not just the, the athlete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's, it's very interesting. So the junior swimmers, when they come into those workshops, um, how little they know. They say, yeah. yeah, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. But <laughs> when they have to cook a meal, I, I, I've actually never cooked a meal before. So... Yeah, I think I think it's those, those are really good, you know. Just um, yeah, I think consumers really like it as well. It, it's really really good opportunity for team building as well, getting together and, and cooking together. Um, yeah, yeah no, good. definitely. Yeah. So we were talking about strength training earlier. Um, how is that fitted into the the swimming program? Because there's a lot of sw time in the pool, um, and obviously, well, I'm not sure about swimming, oh. but in in other sports, there's quite a lot of interference effect with with doing something like an endurance session and then it's like I was talking to Jackson yesterday talk, doing an endurance session and then doing a strength session and they they counteract each other to some respect so I was just wondering how how that's kind of managed in the swim context yeah well coaches have to think of a lot you know it's, <laughs> yeah. it's not just gym it's yeah. not just gym it's, it's for example exams it's studies it's um it's anything so concurrent effects of anything okay um okay. you know um yeah so um, gym is one thing and, and generally, so generally the swimming takes priority and um, yeah. we know that. So we, uh, the, the, the gym load is generally isn't that like really like heavy, very heavy weights. It depends on what you want to do. Sure. And obviously sprinters, they will have more gym emphasis. So they might actually have less volumes and okay. also uh, lower aerobic swimming together um, with, uh, with big gym sessions. So it depends what you're working with, the development stage of the athlete as well. Mm -hmm. And um, also, uh, generally, um, say there's two gym sessions or three gym sessions a week. Coaches okay. uh, can schedule that, um, for example, on days where there's an afternoon off. So you have a swim session, then you have a gym session, and then you have the afternoon off. Okay. For example, Wednesday or Saturday. And also, um, for example, when there's um, a gym session that has a lot of focus on upper body, for example, yeah. and generally which happens, then the session afterwards could be a very big kick set. So focus, okay. focus on kick sets and stay away from, from a, a lot of um, upper body work. So um, there's lots of variables that, uh, that mm -hmm. um, coaches can play with. And, and um, you know, experienced teachers, um, the work, how, how, how they, um, yeah, how, how it all interferes with each other. But generally the swimming always comes first, yeah. except when you really want to create some changes um, beginning season, then, um, then that might actually get more emphasis than usual. 
Okay, yeah. and I guess you're saying that because there's all these other factors, not just obviously the training. So there's the, like if they've we've got lots of schoolwork or they've got exams yes. or whatever. So how do you ensure that you kind of the coaches know what's going on, um, and how many different stresses the athletes are dealing with? Yeah. So communication. So yeah. that's the biggest <laughs> one. Yeah, communication, yeah. and I think that's a, that's a really important one. So. As a scientist, we, we are sometimes focused on, on data, right? But mm. in the end, um, especially in swimming, like um, we are pretty lucky with our sport as well. That one, we really, like it's quite easy to know what we're working towards because sure. the pool is 50 meters. So, you know, it's, it's standard length. Uh, so we know mm. what times we're targeting. And also um, our coaches generally see our athletes uh, go through work um, every day, right? Okay. So they can actually speak to the athlete every day. They see them swim the training sessions every day. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they pick up lots um, in terms of um, seeing how the, the athlete goes through work. Mm -hmm. And if something's not right, it's, it's as easy as just having a conversation with the athlete and saying, like, hey, what's going on? Sure. And our data ob obviously support that to uh, support um, making more informed decisions. Um, but, yeah, generally the, the biggest one there is communication um, mm -hmm. and awareness. And um, yeah. Just being aware as a coach when holidays are uh, when the exam loads are um yeah that's really important. cycles of, of uh, female swimmers yeah that's really important so you, you were mentioning the data what kind of things do you do you measure to, to monitor the training load in swimmers so data that we use um yeah. well generally like the simplest one is a uh, training volumes and also intensity so an rpe and um training volume so that's generally probably everywhere that people that's that's just the basics uh, that, that people monitor um, from my perspective for some of our top swimmers i actually dissect um their training sessions and, and yeah. categorize them into different zones um, okay. but that's more from an evaluation tool so um that's more from uh yeah sitting down to the, with the coach and actually looking at responses of the athletes and just understanding what they've actually done um, and it changes week by week and session by session okay yeah. Makes sense. So do they, um, so I know in, in other sports like heart rate and thing are measured after the session or heart rate variability probably more commonly. Is yeah. that also something that the swimmers, swimmers might do? Yeah, so some groups do that. Yeah, so, okay. so, yeah. so for example, monitoring of heart rate has become mm -hmm. much easier now than it has, yeah. has been um, because the tools uh, weren't very good, but uh, the tools become much better. And generally that, that, that monitoring happens with aerobic training. So when you get to uh, repetitions of 50s with lots of rest it doesn't really matter heart rate yeah. right so um speed work it doesn't really matter heart rate is not not an important variable mm -hmm. but um for aerobic work yes then we can uh, monitor heart rate yeah and some groups i know they they do monitor heart rate variability too yeah okay interesting yeah. uh when we when i was speaking to dan blues recently he was saying that there's a new kind of thing where with goggles that you can um Mod yeah. monitor i think it's the swim the swim kind of the length so, and the pace yeah. and things is yes. that something i know it's quite a new a new tool i guess is that something that any of your swimmers are using or might well, use? swimmers i work with at the moment yeah. no um, okay. generally there's a, a lot of tools coming on the market everywhere um, and we get lots of requests hey have you seen this have you seen? and my, my perspective generally is, is usually I, I i like other groups trying it out and making sure it really works yeah. And when it really works, uh, then then um, I'd like to try it as well. Like I'm, yeah. Okay. At the moment, we're focusing on on the important and um, yeah. yeah. So it, it will be great when it works. It will be very good when it works. Yeah. Sure. Is there any are there any other kind of uh, tools or techniques or things that you could use yeah. to to monitor that recovery status and so on beyond beyond what you're already doing? Or do you think what you've got is kind of is adequate? Recovery status, well, we, we do also monitor sleep, for example, which is a really important aspect. So uh, quality of sleep and, and hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. And but generally, like uh, from my perspective, the, um, the communication and the observation of athletes going through training and sleep is most yeah. important. And then you can, you can add other variables. You can add performance variables, heart rate variability. Um, so there's lots of other variables that you can include. Um, but first, yeah, take, take those basics, I think. Yeah. Okay. I think I have one last question. Um, so if from your opinion or if from, to give a bit of advice to others working in a similar field what do you think is the best approach to enable the research that you that you do or that you read or or whatever that can get that yeah. into the practice to enable the, the coaches and the athletes to, to perform better what advice do you have for that 
Do you mean applying uh, yes. findings from research? <laughs> yes, yeah, that's so much I'm, more simple. But <laughs> yeah, I think so. That's that's certainly um, like a big part of my job to actually yeah. look at the research and keep reading and keep informing myself. Mm -hmm. And when there's um, some some very interesting um, and strong evidence for certain practices, then we have to talk about that with the coaches. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I've done my PhD too, um, and that was um, answering questions that the coaches had or the athletes had. So, oh, interesting. So Tom, for example, Tom, um, what do you think of caffeine, which was topical? And so yeah. how, how does that affect my, my, uh, my performance? Okay, well, let's try it out. And then we can set up um, a placebo versus caffeine and see how, it actually, how individuals actually respond um, to caffeine without them knowing that they actually took caffeine. So, I mean... And um, there's definitely a good space for um, uh, scientists to mm -hmm. solve questions uh, for yeah. coaches and athletes and to be part of a team that way. Yeah. And also to um, keep on top of um, reading and uh, learning and, um, and relay any information to coaches. And um, when it sounds uh, sensible and it makes sense, then yeah, let's go. Yeah. Sure. And I guess it's also learning from other sports and other contexts. Because although definitely. there's obviously yeah. different challenges, you do have similar challenges. Yeah um as well so yeah yeah awesome. definitely definitely yeah awesome well thank you or any advice you want to share um but i think you've you've given some really interesting insights so yeah 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 there was um yeah there's, I, I prepared a few slides but i'm not i'm not going to share them all but um okay like maybe i'll share one more yeah sure and, um, this one okay Can you see it? yeah yeah big so, muscle <laughs> big muscle right yeah so when you when you like do all like bicep curls every day then you get very big biceps right yeah but what do you think like when you look at the picture on the right what do you think uh, is a little bit a little bit abnormal a little <laughs> bit different he's a bit like a triangle he's not he's not worked on his legs has he yeah so he's he's forgotten to work on his legs and i yeah. think that's in the end like a, an important thing in swimming as well like um for example if you don't work your underwater kick you're not mm -hmm. going to become a better underwater kicker Okay. Right. If you don't practice your start, you're not going to be, become a better starter. You know, an explosive, for example, if you want to become more explosive of okay. the block, well, then you have to work on that. And same thing is um, in physiology. So if you really want to improve um, your physiology, whatever that is, so more mitochondria, more capillaries, mm -hmm. um, so cardiovascular level, muscle level, um, change of respiratory level, you really have to um, challenge it and challenge it appropriately. Okay. And um, so change happens through regular um, um, challenge um, and then also eating well and also resting well. So I think, yeah, everything comes down to that. Just um, okay. yeah, making sure you challenge uh, athletes in certain areas. And mm -hmm. that's where the improvement comes from. Awesome. Well, that's very good advice. I think it's to consider the whole picture. And like you said, painting different colors. That was a really interesting quote. Yeah, so. And I think in, in swimming, it's, it, it's such a good sport that we know what we're working towards. Sure. So we know, we know what kind of times um, we want athletes to target, well, mm -hmm. we, we're targeting. And yeah. we also know how that could actually look like. So in terms of splits, in terms of stroke rates, in terms of stroke length then. Mm -hmm. So all these elements we can actually um, um, train and we can um, um, monitor progress in training so um it's a really good sport to actually um, collect some data on, on that regard as well yeah awesome well there's, i'm sure there's lots of space for researchers and, and other coaches to to get involved and answer the questions that probably still remain in swimming yeah 